I want you to open up your Bibles this morning to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 38 through 41. 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 38 through 41. My message is entitled, There is Death in the Pot. There is death in the pot. It's a phrase that was said to the prophet Elisha by his students. There is death in the pot. That's the title of my message today. 2 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 38 right through to 41. Beginning with verse 38, it says, And Elijah came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophet were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage, make a brew, a stew, for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full. He made a lap sack. You know, if you ever see the apron, you just kind of fold it over, and you make a lap sack type of a thing. And came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And of course, they were speaking to the prophet Elisha. O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. They couldn't eat any of it. But he said, Then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot. And he said, Pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm, no evil thing, is that what that Hebrew word means, in the pot. There is death in the pot. Let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, as we consider this subject this morning, it's so vast, Lord God, and I feel so overwhelmed. Lord, bring things to my mind. Let me systematically think them through. And open the hearts of thy people, Lord God, to receive the engrafted word, which you say is able to save their souls. For We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, at this juncture... What had happened was the prophet Elijah had been caught up in the chariot of fire and he had gone to heaven. And now the mantle of his ministry had fallen to Elijah who had received a double portion of his spirit. He told Elijah, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah had said to him, if you can see me get caught up, then you will have that double portion that you're looking for. And one of the ministries of both Elijah and Elisha, beloved, they had founded something known as the School of the College of the Prophets. And they did that to teach and preach, uh, or young men, so they could teach and preach the word, will, and ways of God throughout the land of Israel. What had happened at that time is people started walking away from the word of God, like a lot of people are doing today. And so to ensure that the true word of the Lord would be preached in Israel, Elijah and then his successor, Elisha, founded this school to train the prophets, to train these students. And every year, what Elisha would do is he would make a circuit, beloved, and try to go out Israel, and he'd visit all of these prophetic schools, and he'd go and make sure and, and ensure that they were preaching the true word of the Lord. Being a prophet himself, what he would do then is give them special insights into the word of God that God had given to him. And so here's the prophet Elisha right now at the prophetic school at Gilgal. Uh, Gilgal. This was his yearly visit, beloved. And in anticipation of this visit, the students thought what they would do is have a great feast to honor their master as he's coming. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, amen? The problem was at that particular time, there was a dearth, there was a famine in the land. Food was hard to come by. And so when Elijah showed, Elisha showed up, they said, Master, we don't have much food. He said, well, go out into the uh, forest and forage for some food. So all of the students went out. And as they went out, there was one student in particular who saw this wild vine. And it kind of circled around the tree, and there was all this beautiful fruit hanging off it. It reminds me, there's a certain type of apple, I forgot what kind it is. It looks so beautiful, so luscious, but if you take two bites, it would kill you. It's poisonous. And it's in the United States, and they have to post signs around it saying, don't eat of this tree. And they have them everywhere because the fruit looks so enticing that you just want to pick it and you want to eat it. But anyways, beloved, they thought they would take all of these vegetables, all of these fruits, all these wild gourds, and they shred them up, and they'd put them into this pot, they'd seethe pottage, they'd make a big pot of brew and stew so everyone could eat. Now that sounded pretty good, didn't it? 
hey, this is the way we're going to honor our master Elisha. We're going to have a great feast right now. I mean, there's not been any food in the land before, but now we have found some food. So this was their plan. Look at verses 38 and 39. And Elijah came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land, and the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servants, Set on the great pot, and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs, and found a wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. In other words, in their excitement and expectation for this Gilgal event, one of the students went out when he saw these luscious fruit, he started picking them. He said, voila. He must have thought he hit the jackpot, amen. You can't find vegetables. You can't find any fruit in the market. can't find much meat in the market. But here we are with this luscious fruit that's just gr- off the, just for your picking. So he starts picking them, and he puts them into his lap sack until he gets a whole uh, uh, sack full of them. And then he goes back to that pot, back to the students, and he starts shredding them and putting them inside of the pot. And I can just see them stirring the pot and saying, oh, man, I can't wait to eat. This is going to be some of the best brew and stew we've had for a long time. Amen. Man, I can just see this tantalizing, appetizing food just making their mouth water and their juices salivating in their mouth. And they didn't have any idea of what was going on. You see, they wanted to surprise their master. But come to find out, what happened was there was some poisonous content in the pot. You see, after they started eating for a while, they started tasting this foul, noxious type of uh, aftertaste in their mouth. And then they realized that there was poison in these vegetables, that there was poison inside of the pot. And so they cried out to their master, Oh, man of God, there is death in this pot. Don't eat it, in other words. Unless you do something, Elisha, we are going to die. Unless you work a supernatural miracle like you did at Jericho. You see, at Jericho, they couldn't drink of the waters there. So Elisha came along. It was bitter. It was killing the people. It was killing the animals. So Elisha said, get me some salt. And he took a handful of salt, and he threw it in the water, and he purified the waters at Jericho. So right now, what Elisha does is he takes a handful of meal, and he takes them, and he throws them in the pot. And then when he throws them in the pot, beloved, he says, okay, you can eat now. Uh, what? You can eat it now. I'd have said, listen to you, Master, with all due respect, my mama didn't raise any dummy after you. <laughs> you eat it first, and if you're still alive after you eat it, then I'll chow down. Well, beloved, they didn't say that. And why didn't they say that? I'll tell you why they didn't say that. Because they knew Elisha was a man of God. They had seen the preaching and the teaching of Elisha. They had seen his testimony. They knew he was a true man of God that what he said was true, that he preached the true word of the Lord, and so they believed him. And the Bible says here that they sat down after that, and they had a great feast. Little did they know that they were eating something that was poisonous, but God had supernaturally sterilized it. You see, there was no magical power in the meal that he threw inside of that pot. It was God. God works through supernatural means, through people and through things. Amen? He's always done it. We see it, Jesus multiplied fishes and he multiplied loaves. In fact, Elijah goes on and shows how he multiplied loaves. And he ended up feeding the people. So they found out at that time that there was not only a dearth in the land, but there was death in the pot. Oh, beloved, I want you to look at verse 40. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. Beloved, listen to me, please. I want you to notice that these men were totally oblivious to the danger and to the death that surely awaited them. And soon after they began to eat, they started tasting that foul thing. But listen to me, beloved. They had no idea that this was lethal, no idea that this was toxic. It looked good. It started tasting pretty good to them. It was that aftertaste when they saw the effects of what was happening to it. Then they realized, listen, we can't eat of this. Oh, thou man of God, oh, thou man of God, there is death in this pot. Do something before we die. Intervene, plead with God for us so we don't die. You hear me now, beloved? They're saying this. 
there's deadly danger here in this part. And we know that God hears your prayer, Elijah. We know that God heeds your prayer. We know that God answers your prayer. So we know that he will do something right now. Oh, beloved, praise the Lord. They knew the right person to ask and to decide before God. Amen. Someone that could get a hold of the horns of the altar. Someone, in his, they looked at his past, and this person was daily praying every day, regular routine, and God knew it. And that's why God made Elijah the successor of Elijah. And God watches our testimony, and God watches us every day, doesn't he? And if there been anybody else, beloved, that God would have never worked a miracle through that person. But God knew Elisha was, true, was a true man of God, so he picked the right person. You hear me now. There's a lot of death in the pot of Christendom today. I want to say that again. There is a lot of death in the pot of Christendom today. Now, beloved, we need to be serious. There are very deceptive and disastrous and a deadly effect on things that are going on that are affecting Christians, and they are totally oblivious to it. Why, preacher? Because they do not know the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? I'm saying many who know not their Bibles. Many who do not know the cardinal doctrines of the faith, beloved. Many are being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to, receive, uh, uh, to deceive. These are the unsuspecting and the discerning. And far too many are falling away from the faith, beloved, and they don't even know it. And God warns in Proverbs 14, 2, that there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. It seems right okay, but the end of it started getting lethal and toxic and deadly. The end thereof is the ways of death. And God warns in Hebrews 2, 3, he says, let us not neglect. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, That day, the second advent, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed prior to the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. The great and final apostasy that the Bible has spoken about, that word is an apostasia, that is the, fi the final apostasy, has now come upon the church. And beloved, today multitudes in the part of Christendom are being spiritually, doctrinally, poisoned and destroyed, yet they're just as oblivious to it, uh, uh, to the inherent and inescapable danger, beloved, as these students were. They just go right along, keep on eating. They don't see anything wrong with it because everybody around them just seems to be doing it. And so instead of measuring what you're saying, measuring what you're doing, measuring what you're believing by the infallible, inerrant word of God, instead you're just saying, I'll go along to get along because the majority's doing it. Well, that's a very deadly thing. How did this happen? Well, the Bible warns that in the last days, every man will do what seems right in his own eyes. Every man will do, like in the days of the judges. Forget the Word of God. Forget what the preachers are saying. Forget what the church teaches. Every man will do what's right in his own eyes. You see, beloved, they place their thoughts of right and wrong. They place their ideas, their opinions of right and wrong, their philosophy of right and wrong above that of the word, will, and ways of God. And God says when you do that, there is death in the pot of your life. It's noxious. It's toxic. It's spiritually lethal to the soul. And so they don't care what the Bible teaches. They don't care what the true teachers in the churches of, uh, of Christ really teach. And they don't care God, what God really has to say, beloved. You see, the devil has gotten us to ignore the true word, will, and ways of God and Scripture and turn from the church, which is the body and bride and building of Christ. And the Bible says the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. What's the pillar and ground of the truth? The parachurch ministries? Uh-uh. There's not even a, 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 a reference in the Bible for anything like that. What is the pillar and ground of the truth, the Bible says? The local church. God says, that's what I work through. I work through my preachers uh, in the local church. And you see, beloved, so what has happened is this. Is people have developed an independent spirit instead of an interdependent spirit as the gospel commands us to be. We're to be dependent on one another. We're to do what God wants us to do. 
We're to know his word, know his faith, know his doctrines. We're to listen. We come here to the spiritual hospital. This isn't a museum where you come to gawk at people who are already perfected. This is the spiritual hospital where you come in to take the spiritual medicine so you can grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? And that goes from the pulpit to the pew because we all are in the process. Now, how did this happen, beloved? I'll tell you how it happened. In fact, Hebrews 5, uh, 13 warns us that those who are, don't know the Word of God and don't really study out the Word of God are unskillful in the world, word of righteousness, for they are a babe. But strong meat belongeth unto them who are full of age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's Hebrews 5, 13 and 14. You see, the man of God that's got his nose in the book, the man of God who's always praying over the Scriptures, the man of God who's seeking God's face, God says he's able to discern what's right and what's wrong because he now is the shepherd of the sheep and he can protect his little sheepies. Would you say amen out there? And that's what I'm trying to do to you this morning. That's what I'm trying to do to you and all you folks who watch my TV and I know are going to write me after this. You see, there's been a great moral and spiritual lukewarmness that has fallen over the church, hasn't there? When I say the church, I don't mean TCM in particularly, but the church in general. And God says about this lukewarmness of his people that he will spew and vomit them out of his mouth. Now, I didn't say that. God said that to the church at Laodicea. And you know, less than 20 years later, the church of Laodicea was gone. And same thing would happen here. If we go into moral and spiritual lukewarmness, you hear what I'm saying, beloved. I'm saying that there is death in the part of Christendom today. Death that is destroying and deceiving souls, beloved. Multitudes of ignorant, naive, unsuspected believers. Although they are sincere, they are sincerely wrong. They're oblivious to what's going on. And beloved, listen to me. You hear me now. If I were to give you a cup of milk, you say, Pastor Joel, I'm thirsty. But you didn't know it, but I put a drop of cyanide in there or arsenic in there, and you're thirsty, and you're sincere, but you drink it down, and you'd be sincerely dead, surely dead. You'd die, amen, no matter how much sincerity you have. You hear me now, sincerity doesn't help you one bit. I've been sincere in a lot of things, and I've been sincerely wrong. How about you? And I had to eat crow afterwards, and it's best to eat it when it's hot. Believe me when I tell you. Don't let your crow get cold, amen? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying they're morally and spiritually eating and they're swallowing and they're dying from the poisonous spiritual pottage of Satan's counterfeit Christianity that is rampantly circulating throughout much of Christendom today. So Christianity needs to wake up because there's death in the pot. Look at verse 41. But he, Elijah, said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot, and he said, Pour out uh, for the people, that they may eat, or they may now eat. And there was no harm, no evil thing uh, in the pot. Thank God, thank God, thank God. There was a spiritually mature man of God there who was grounded in the Word of God, who knew exactly what to do. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, unless and until you know God's true word, will, and ways, there will always be the danger of death in the pot for your life, no matter how sincere you are. I can't drive that home enough. Because people think sincerity is all it's going to take. And that's not true. That's the devil's counterfeit. You see, what Elijah did, he acted under the divine direction of God because he was a man of God. And previously, I told you, he had uh, uh, purified the waters of Jericho with salt. You know, God tells us to follow men of God after we look at their life and we've seen their testimony for us for years and they've been consistent. God says, that's a man of God. Follow him. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 7, 17, and 24, they will obey them to have the rule over you. For they watch for their, your souls. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Follow that man. You know, people, I don't follow anybody. Well, Bible, you're wrong. Now, you just don't want to follow man. You want to follow a man that's walking with God, and he always tells you to do what? Check it out. Amen? 
You check it out. Make sure that man of God is teaching you the truth. You see, they're morally and spiritually and diabolically. Satan has got his hands inside of the church. He knew he couldn't destroy it from without. So what he did now was he crept into the church. And he started in the pews and then in the pulpits, started corrupting the church, corrupting the word of God. And so people, beloved, when they get saved, they think, you know, you need real milk, like a, like a mother needs, a baby needs mother's milk. So they think that, hey, I'm going to go to church and I'll get everything that I need. Well, beloved, you ought to come to church. You ought to get what you need, but you ought to check it out and read the word yourself. Would you say amen? So you can find out whether or not it's true. Because that's how God supernaturally protects and corrects and disinfects and perfects his church and his people with the spiritual milk, meal and milk and meat of his spirit-empowered word preached by his true ministers, beloved. That's how God changes us and consecrates us. That's how God conforms us and transforms us into the image of Christ. The Holy Scriptures alone are the divine standard whereby we are to measure the faith, the truth, the doctrine, not your feelings, not your experience, not your visions, not your dreams, not your sincerity. None of that is how you measure the truth of the Word of God. Is it mentioned in the Word of God? Amen? And you judge it from there. You know, the Bible says in the last days, Satan's going to work many lying signs and wonders that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. If it were possible, the very elect are going to say, I see what they're doing, and I hear what they're saying, but it's not what the Word of God says, and that cannot ever be of God. This could be old Slewfoot himself that's crept into the church trying to deceive people. And you know, beloved, the truth hurts sometimes, doesn't it? You, you, you want to believe things. You want to trust people. You, you, you don't want to. I, I love to be loved. How about you? But the problem is people love to be loved too much and they don't preach the truth of the word of God and God's men need to do that. So there was poison in that pot, like there's poison in the pot today. And how God's people will know is that his true ministers will start ministering the word of God. They'll start preaching the truth of the Word of God, exegeting the truth of the Word of God, not taking a text out of context and making a pretext and tell all their little stories and people get all emotionally weepy or whatever, but it has nothing to do with strengthening your faith. Amen? You hear what I'm saying to you? It has nothing to do. So Satan's doing everything he can right now to put his wild herbs and vines and gourds and moral and spiritual doctrines and deceptions and heresies in the church. And ladies and gentlemen, what Satan offers and tempts and seduces uh, us outwardly seems so attractive and so luscious and delicious and irresistible because these wild herbs and vines and gourds, they, they don't require much from us. We don't have to suffer much. We don't have to sacrifice much bear the cross. We don't have to mortify and crucify the flesh thereof. We don't have to do any of that. So you got people preaching the smooth things that people want to hear, the ear ticklers, amen? But God says there's death in the pot there, and you should know right now, you should know what those ingredients are because I have given you my word. Would you say amen? You know, beloved, you hear me now. Outwardly, it may look good, but inwardly, there's poison there, and it poisons your convictions, and it poisons your conduct and your character, beloved. And you slowly but surely start morally and spiritually compromising and walking away, and ultimately you die, and the worst part is you don't even know it. You don't even know it. Man, I got a beautiful home. I've got money in my pocket. I drive a nice car. My life is comfortable. God surely must be blessing me. He, you love it. Romans 2, 4 says, the goodness of God is to do what with you? It's to lead you to repentance. God is a good God. He blesses even the atheist. I could never be an atheist. It takes too much faith. I couldn't be an atheist. How about you? But you know, Satan has never changed his taxes, beloved. Never. He always tries to corrupt of God by appealing to our tactile senses, as with Eve in the Garden of Eden with the forbidden fruit. The Bible says she saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, so she took it 
of the, of the forbidden fruit thereof, and she ate it. But there was death in the pot. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life caused both her and her husband Adam to plunge all humanity into sin, death, and ruin. That's why we're in the fifth that we're in right now. You said, Pastor, all they did was eat some forbidden fruit. Oh, what they did was break God's law after knowing God's law, after being taught by God, after speak, God speaking to them personally. So it was much more than that, isn't it? I know, are you folks a little hot in here? Can somebody turn the heat down? No, it's me. <laughs> See, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, sure, Adam and Eve were sincere. Sure, these students were sincere. Sure, many Christians today are sincere, beloved. They may have the best intentions in what they're doing. But that can't protect anyone from the disastrous consequences that await them who indulge in Satan's spiritual poison, especially after being warned by the Word of God and warned by the men of God. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, outwardly they're being seductively deceived and attracted what looks ominously like it's Christian. But inwardly it's not, and God does not bless it, and God does not release his grace with it. He does not activate his spirit in it. So it isn't any wonder that so many people are professing to know Christ, but they're living like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. There was death in the pot, whatever they're eating or believing. Amen? And God says that's what's going to happen to us in the last days. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You know, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, he commands us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, how much? All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is none of the Father but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, when I preach like that, people's nature kicks up. They want to stand up and say, I don't want to hear that. But, beloved, I'm telling you, I'm trying to give you God's medicine. You need to hear it. You hear me now. If I didn't care for your soul, do you think I'd preach something like this? Do you think I'd put myself on TV and get the repercussions that I get? There's no possible way, beloved. You see, the devil always, he always uses the lust of the flesh, always uses the lust of the eyes, always uses the pride of life. I want to be a success. I, 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 me. Me, me, me. Isn't that the philosophy of the world? And it's crept into the church. I hate it when they do so-and-so's ministry. If, if I ever had a private ministry, it wouldn't say Paul Botello's ministry. It would say God's ministry or TCM's ministry or Adam's ministry. It would have nothing to do with exalting myself. And I don't try to sound falsely noble or humble in that, beloved, but that's just wrong. It's just wrong. And these people are getting... Rich off it, beloved. I'm saying this, beloved. That just like Adam and Eve were deceived in the Garden of Eden through the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes of pride of life, so aren't many Christians today. What's wrong with hanging out with all these different Christians? Pay attention. I'm going to teach you some things. You see, beloved, there's poisonous ingredients in the pot of Christendom today. Many of the Bibles are corrupted. Did you hear what I said? Many of the Bibles are corrupted. Many of the doctrines are unscriptural. Many of the movements are heretical. Many of the philosophies are certainly unchristian, and many churches are in apostasy, beloved. And there are many, many false preachers and teachers and leaders in them doing nothing but the devil's work. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're looking for lamp chops, and that be you and me. You say, what, Pastor Joel? Hey, you listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 and 50. He says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. There, therefore there is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into the ministers of righteousness, but such are false apostles, false deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. They mention Jesus. The devil mentions Jesus. You see, that means nothing, beloved. But they preach another Jesus. And they preach another spirit. 
Paul Warnock goes on to say, and they preach another gospel whom many receive and believe and follow. And unsuspectingly, beloved, they die because there's death in the pot that they're morally and spiritually eating from. You see, folks, oh, how desperately the church in Christendom today needs the true word of God to be preached by the true man of God in the true churches of God out of the true Bibles of God anointed by the true Holy Spirit of God. Would you say amen? There was a time when all preachers, God, I was coming up, preached like I'm preaching to you. I've always told you that. But now we become professionals. We pronunciate, articulate, communicate the word we raise in God perfectly. Articulate, you know, you have to. Instead of letting the Spirit of God put his hand on you and start preaching. I'll never forget when they were trying to teach me homiletics class. I said, I want to know it. I said, why? Because I said, I want God to teach me how to preach. I don't want to copy him or copy that person. I want God to speak through me using my personality and the way he wants to do it. And so I was always getting questioned, well, how come you didn't write that? I said, because I didn't feel like it. It didn't apply to me. <laughs> None of that was going to save my soul anyways. I'm saying there's many false and fraudulent, many aberrational, heretical, many unorthodox and novel and heterodox doctrines and things uh, that are uh, unknowingly being preached today, beloved. You see, by Satan's tickling ministers, they're telling people what they want to hear. It's so easy to build a following like that, isn't it? Tell people what they want to hear, not need to hear. Tell them what they want to hear. Let's get them to love you and like you like Joel Osteen. I hate that, that, that blasphemy to me, that name. And put that last name on. <laughs> okay. What's going on? Well, God says in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They're what? My people, not the heathen. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Our Lord Jesus Christ warned that when the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the ditch. ditch. And I don't care how sincere you are. That guy blind, and you're sincerely following him, as blind as he is, you're going to end up just where he is. Amen? So your sincerity means nothing. I'm hoping you leave here today and say, I love my Bible, I'll read my Bible, I'll study my Bible, I'll memorize my Bible. I will know the word of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Because if you don't, beloved, it's going to bring death. Death to your soul and spirit. Death to your mind and your convictions. Death to your character and your conduct. Because there's death in the pot. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ instituted the church to be the moral and spiritual light and salt of the world. Didn't you say that? He instituted the church to be the moral and spiritual compass of the world, beloved. To be counterculture to be the moral and spiritual example to the world, to bring it his salvation. We're to lift up the values and the ethics and the beliefs and the principles of the world, beloved. Why? So people can learn, even if they don't get saved, how to do righteously and equitably and fairly and justly. Amen? Not watch these guys being arrested on the TV who claim to be preachers because they're having sex or homosexuality or what they're doing is they're buying homes and jets and... And people are just pouring out their money and feeding these people. And they think nothing of it. Well, you know, we, we have to get around. We can't take a commercial flight. No, but you can bilk your people for a $40 million jet. That's just what Jesus did, right? Is that what the apostles did? They went out and bought their own boat so they could sail across the Mediterranean. <laughs> they bought their own Mercedes-Benz ox cart so they could carry them through the roads uh, throughout the Roman Empire. You see, beloved, we're in a real fix today because all it does is bring impiety and impurity and immorality into the church, iniquity in the church, beloved. And we see that today at global proportions, amen? And that's why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, he said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, Timothy. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. And he goes on, Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. I won't be here while they're getting ready to lop off my head, Timothy. I'm passing the baton like I taught you last week. On to you. 
You're going to have to stand behind the pulpit. You're the one that's going to have to do the preaching. You're the one that's going to have to watch out for their souls. You're the one that's going to have to answer their questions. You're going to have to be the one that's there for them because I'm not going to be there anymore. You know, beloved, when you look around today, the church is in that great apostasy, isn't it? I'm not talking about the cults and the occult, beloved. That's obvious and blatantly non-Christian. But I want you to think about this, beloved. Under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church today is filled with isms. What are you saying, preacher? There's Roman Catholicism. There's Protestantism. There is Calvinism and Arminianism and Charismatic and Pentecostalism. There is Seventh-day Adventism. There is Ecumenism. There is Dispensationalism. There is Neo-Evangelicalism, Liberalism, Emergent Churchism, beloved. Oh, what confusion. There's death in the pot. What am I to believe as a Christian? How do I know who's teaching what and if it's true or not? Is there a standard? Is something that I can measure what's going on if it's a, the Word of God or if it's Satan, old Slewfoot himself that has crept into the church trying to corrupt it and lull God's people to sleep? Well, I want to tell you something. Hosea went on to say there'd be a famine in the land, but it wouldn't be a famine he said of food, and it wouldn't be a famine of bread. He said it would be a famine of preaching and teaching the true word of God. And he said men will go to and fro all throughout all the earth in the last days. Look, at where can I find the word of the Lord? Who's preaching the truth? What am I to believe? I want to go to heaven. And I hope you can say that's what I want to do. You see, there's a famine in the land today. There's a famine in the land of preaching, beloved. And the toxic and lethal ingredients in this part of Christianity that as we look today, you can see how dangerous it can be. People are doing what's right in their own eyes, claiming to be prophets, claiming to be apostles, saying that they're being caught up to heaven, doing all these different things. And yet the Bible knows nothing of that. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, let's take a quick look here at some of the things that bring death in the pot. First of all, beloved, there's death in the pot of the new Bibles. Now listen to me, and I want you to pay attention. I've got to roll through this so I can make the time thing here. Satan has forever tried to corrupt the Word of God. Amen. He did it with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then Jesus becomes the second Adam on the Mount of Temptation, Matthew chapter 4. He tried to misquote the Word of God to Jesus, but Jesus said, it is written. And he corrected them. Amen. He pointed out. Satan's error. Now, the historic Orthodox Christian church has always believed in four facts concerning the Word of God. I'm going to go through them quickly. I could preach a sermon on each one. Number one, they believed in divine inspiration of the Word of God. Say that. Divine inspiration. That is, every word in the Bible is God-breathed. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by Theonoustos. By inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men and women of God may be perfect unto all good works. Would you say amen? The Word of God is inspired, beloved. God divinely inspired the Holy Scriptures. They originated in His mind. They were spoken through His mouth. And they were given to man because man needs the Word of God if he's ever going to be saved. Would you say amen? Number two, beloved. The historic Orthodox Christian Church, as we believe here, believes in divine revelation. Divine revelation. Not just divine inspiration, divine revelation. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, the Bible says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture was any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in the Old Testament by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved, as they were borne along by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon this man, and they said, write this down, and they'd write it. Write this down, and they'd bring all things to remembrance. Remember Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, said to the, his disciples, when the Holy Ghost comes, he will remind you of all the things that I said, and you will write it down. Would you say amen out there? So they wrote it down, beloved. It's the Holy Bible that we have right now. God's people need God's word. Would you say amen? Number three, not only divine inspiration and uh, revelation, but divine preservation. Divine preservation. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, Jesus says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot 
or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. God himself promises that he would supernaturally and providentially preserve his inspired word of God that he gave to his men and his people forever. He would make sure it was passed on from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. In, in Psalm chapter 12, verse 7, the Bible says that this word has been purified in the furnace of fire seven times. Now, it's a reference to purifying metals, gold, silver. What do you do? You put them in a pot. And you keep boiling it. And get as hot as you can till the dross comes to the top. And you scrape it off. And there's a whole bunch of dross. And then the next time you... There's a little... And look, till finally there's what? There's nothing but pure gold and pure silver. Amen? So God makes sure we get the pure gold and the pure silver of His Word. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. That God promises that one of the blessings... Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. God preserves His Word. Number four. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Divine illumination, divine inspiration, divine revelation, divine preservation, divine illumination. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said this, They shall all be taught of God. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he was referencing the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets had prophesied that one of the great blessings of the New Testament believer is that God the Holy Spirit, the resident teacher, the blessed illuminator would indwell in them. And those who prayerfully read and carefully studied the Word of God, He would bring the true meaning of the Word to their eyes and to their mind and to their soul. Would you say amen out there? So my question to you today is this. Now listen to me now. My question to you is, what Bible today is the true, inspired, and preserved Word of God? Now that's a good question, isn't it? I mean, there's such a glut of Bibles in the market today for every particular read, every type of interpretation you can imagine. But did God preserve His Word? Beloved, is it the KJV, the King James Version? Is it the New King James Version? Is it the New International Version? Is it the New Re Revised Standard Version? Is it the New American Standard Bible? Is it the New English Bible? Is it the New Living Bible? Is it all the different Catholic Bibles? Is it the Message Bible written by the Mormons? Is it the Amplified Bible? All the other Bibles. What is the true and inspired and preserved Word of God on this earth today? I think we understand that. Amen. Which Bible, I'm saying, which Bible is to be used by God's people as the final court of appeals in all matters of faith, doctrine, and morals? I believe it's the KJV. Now listen to me now, I'm not a KJV onlyist. I believe the KJV is the preserved Word of God for the English-speaking world, and all the Bibles translated from the same manuscripts as the King James Bible into their mother language, and that is the preserved Word of God from them. In other words, they come from the same manuscripts that the KJV did. Would you say amen out there? Now, Satan has a whole hodgepodge of inferior Bibles out there, a lot of transliterations. For example, the NIV, and I can't tell you, you know when that came out, within two months, some of the, some of the uh, translators on the NIV dropped dead, and they don't know why they dropped dead? I do. You don't mess with God's Word, I'll tell you right now. But the, it's a transliteration. In other words, it's called dynamic equivalency, and I can't give you a theology class, but a bunch of guys get around, and because the publishing high, houses hire them, and they say, what do you think this means, Steve? And so they debate back and forth. They say, okay, then we'll write that down. They're not writing God's Word. They're not translating God's Word. What are they doing? Thought for thought. This is what we think it means. This is what we think it means. And that's why when you read the NIV, you see so many portions of Scripture, so many words. The syntax, the verbs. What is a present tense is a past tense. What is a past tense is now a present tense. See, only the Holy Spirit could guide men to write the true word of the Lord and be consistent and preserve that word. Would you say amen out there? Now, there are, basically speaking, there are only two schools of manuscripts from which we get all of our Bibles today. This heat makes my lips so dry. Two schools of manuscripts, beloved. First of all, there's the Antiochian or the Northern School. Antioch was the headquarters of the Gentile church whom Paul was the overseer of. 
and they have meticulously preserved the Hebrew Masoretic texts and manuscripts of the Old Testament from which the Jews got their Bibles and from which the KJV is also translated and copied. Amen? And they also meticulously preserved the Greek textus receptus or what we know as the received text of the New Testament. Now, folks, the early church used Bible translated from these manuscripts. Then in the 15th century, God potentially raised up a humanist, not, a, not like you see today, beloved. A humanist was a very godly person to try to do things for people, but he was a scholar. He was a theologian named Desiderius Erasmus Rod- uh, uh, Rododamus. And to take the Latin manuscripts of the Texas Receptus of this Bible and translate it into copies of the Greek from which we get our New Testament. And so, beloved, only the KJV and other Bibles translated from these preserved and protected Hebrew and Greek text manuscripts are the true word of God on earth today because God promises he would preserve his word. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, these are the manuscripts that 53 translators, the great KJV Bible, the greatest Semitic language, in the, or the scholars in the world, beloved, that translated this Bible. Every word was gone over by a Greek or Hebrew expert. Some of them could speak 21 Semitic languages, beloved. And they debated it 53 times. Is this exactly what God said? When the Jews would copy their manuscripts, the scribes, they would say, if it said, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, they'd write it down. The second scribe, 28 of them, they had read it. Thus saith the Lord. There's four words. And 28 times. When they came to the word Lord, they all stopped, take their clothes off, take a bath, and start again. They had such reverence for God. You see, we don't understand about preserving the word of God because so, much, so many Bibles are on the market today. Amen? So, beloved, the 53 translators of the King James Version of the Bible knew about these other manuscripts, but they rejected a lot of them. They didn't want him because they saw the corruptions and the contradictions that were in them, as did Desiderius Erasmus Redodamus. Now, the second school, that's the Antiochian school, the northern school. The second uh, school, beloved, is the Alexandrian or the southern school headquartered in Alexandria, Egypt. When you study the word of God, nothing good ever came out of Egypt. You understand that? Nothing good ever came out of Egypt. I wish I could give you the history of this, but I can't. I'm moving along here. These Old Testament and New Testament manuscripts, beloved, were all Greek translations. The Old Testament wasn't in the Hebrew or the Aramaic. It was in the Greek of scriptures. And they were both partial and inferior manuscripts, and that's why the KJV translators rejected them. But then, beloved, there was the Codex Vaticanus, the manuscript Codex, that's the Latin word for it. Codex Vaticanus, the manuscript, came from the Vatican. And then there was the Codex Sinaiticus, and the Codex Alexandrinus, beloved. You see, these were the so-called newer manuscripts from which all other translations of the Bible on the market today are translated from except the KJV. Now let's talk a moment about the Codex Vaticanus. Okay, was supposedly found by Pope Gregory in the 15th century, locked away in the Vatican Library. Can you believe it? God didn't preserve his word until the 15th century by the Pope? So that's the Codex Vaticanus. Whereas the Codex Sinaiticus, beloved, was found by an agnostic British explorer named Count Tissendorf in the 19th century in a trash can at the foot of a Greek manuscript at the bottom of the Sinai mountain, in a trash can. He says, oh boy, what's this? He wasn't religious, whatever. Even the Greeks threw it out, <laughs> okay? But you know what? He was an entrepreneur. He saw there was money to be made in this. So he snatched it out. And of course, beloved, almost all of the Bibles we have today are using those manuscripts. Now, beloved, listen to me. Do you think God preserved his scriptures, these words? As we look at the Waldensians, the church in the wilderness, the Albigensians, the Huguenots. Do you think that they had the true word of God? Well, we know that they preserved this. See, that's how we got the manuscript. That was a little church like this that the pastors were skilled in the word of God. They translated it perfectly, and they passed it on to the next generation. These were holy men of God, spake 
because they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, let me tell you something. All these other Bibles are from these inferior manuscripts. The King James Version of the Bible, since it was produced, is the only Bible that has spawned all of the revivals this world has ever seen. The Great Welsh Revival, the revivals in England, the revivals across America, the revivals across the world. Why? Because they were preaching the true Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God anointed it and God's people got saved. Would you say amen? Now what's the problem? The problem was this, the church used to be the preserver and the translator of the Scriptures to ensure the precise accuracy. But then when the publishing houses in the 20th century learned that the Bible was the most popular and best-selling book in the world, they saw now that they could make a ton of money because what they do is they copyright their translations. You know, when I was writing my dissertation, if I quoted another Bible, I had it because it was copyrighted, and you can, only, you can only use so many words from that, you have to list it. You know you don't have to do that with the KJV? It's not copyrighted. Why? How can you write God's Word. Every other Bible, from Nelson Publishers, or Zondervan, whatever it may be, but you don't have to do that with the KJV because everybody understood you cannot uh, uh, charge anyone for copying the Word of God. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, these other Bibles either add to the Word of God or they take from, and the Bible is explicitly clear. You who have read the Bible, doesn't God say, I will curse anyone that adds to my words? And I will uh, curse them if they subtract from my words. All the plagues of the book of Revelation will be on those people that take from my words, God says. That's how serious God is about his word. And that's how serious we need to be about God's word. So, beloved, let me ask you this. With all these Bibles today, how do we know what uniform biblical standard or constant of truth What's the final arbitrator, court of appeals on all matters of faith and morals and doctrine when problems and disputes arise in the church? So which Bible should we use? Which Bible should we memorize? Which Bible should we refer to? Which Bible should we call the true Word of God? Which Bible should we test and prove all things by, beloved? Which Bible should we sanction and promote as the true preserved Word of God when all these other translations, they differ in translation and meaning, beloved? I say to you that it's the KJV. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, any Bible that's translated from those manuscripts, so it doesn't have to be just the KJV, but unfortunately in America, that's what it is today. So there's death in the part of the NIV, and there's death in the part of the New King James Version of the Bible. You realize they, listen to me now, when scholars study the KJV, you have to have a sixth grade education to understand it. That's what they say. You know the New King James Version is supposed to be easier to read? You have to have an 11th grade education. So it's not that they're making it easier to read. See, what they say that there's a ton of money in it if we can copyright it and sell it and make millions and millions of dollars. Who cares about the souls of God's people? Who cares about the truth? Who cares about true doctrine? Who cares about that? And God's people have gotten so lazy today, beloved. They say, ah, no problem, the NSIV, or I'll use the NSCB, and I'll use all these other Bibles. Well, beloved, the KJV is the Word of God. And if you're reading any other alleged easier-to-read Bible, then always, always measure what that Bible says that you're reading according to the KJV. Look it up and find out if they're translating it the, way, the, the right way. Well, I've got a few more things, and I just ran out of time. You want me to continue? You sure? Okay. So that's the first thing we see, beloved. The problem? New Bibles. We need to have the preserved Word of God. Amen? There's death in the part of the false gospels today. You see, there's the heretical prosperity gospel going through the church today, which teaches that Christ came to make us rich. So a lot of people on TV are all preaching that. Christ came to make you rich. Best life now. And then there's the heretical social gospel that substitutes. Listen to me philanthropic humanism for evangelism and saving souls, and thus to avoid the offense and hostility and the persecution of the cross and preaching of the true gospel, and to appease their own conscience for not doing this preaching, they instead teach that the mission of the church is to help the poor and needy. My Bible says that's not the Great Commission. How about yours? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. 
Preach the word to all nations. That's what my Bible says. Now, I'm not against good works, and I'm not against helping the poor and needy. But that is not the main commission. That's the social gospel because of the offense of the cross when you preach it. You want to feed the needy and the poor? Preach to them first. Let them know you're doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're sinners who need to be saved by the grace of God. And this God loves them and died for them in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, beloved, this, this neo-evangelicalism that's uh, in the church today, beloved, all these false gospels, I should say, that are in the church today. Then there's the health and wealth gospel. You see, that says that not only are we rich like Abraham, but we're to have perfect health like him and live long, long, long like him. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't even watch. Uh, I, I was driving around my truck the other day. I heard a guy preaching that. I almost drove off the road. I, I, I mean, I can't tell you, beloved. And, and so then there's the word of uh, faith gospel today that teaches that we have the same supernatural power and ability to just speak the word. And these are the two key words. We declare and decree that God can do this and we will do that. We declare and decree. Listen, beloved, you know what I say to them? I had a person say that to me. I said, you show me in the word of God where you have the supernatural power to declare and decree like God and his apostles. Show me where. Sounds great, doesn't it? Add a little, a little bit of poison in there. Mix it up with a little bit of truth and you get a nice counterfeit. I declare and I decree. Doesn't that sound good? The word of faith gospel, beloved. And they say that they can speak things into existence and they can rebuke and bind the devil. Beloved, do you understand that the second greatest power in the universe is Lucifer who fell? And his counterpart is not God the Father. It's not even Jesus Christ. It's Michael the archangel because Satan was an archangel, the covering cherub. I mean, it's just amazing to me. And people buy this. Why? This is the deceptive positive thinking crowd and the deceptive name and claiming crowd and your best life now crowd taught by heretics like Creflo Dollar and Kenneth Copeland and Joyce Ma and Kenneth Hangen and Olstein and Jesse Duplantis, Joel Osteen is his name, <laughs> and others. But beloved, there is death in the pot. Now listen to me, i got another thing for you. Number three, there's the death in the pot of neo-evangelicalism. Now you want to pay close attention to this point. There's death in the pot of neo or new evangelicalism. This new form of liberal and compromising Christianity began in the 1950s with a man named Horn, uh, ha, excuse me, Harold Ockengay, I told you last week, the former pastor of Park Street Church in Boston. Now, I can remember when Park Street Church in Boston was the most influential church in America, and most of the other churches in America took their lead from Harold Ockengay of Park Street Church in Boston. Now, now, beloved, he taught that Christian unity at the expense of truth and that all churches should work together as long as they believe in Jesus. Well, the devil believes in Jesus and he trembles. <laughs> should we work with him? Now, but listen, listen to me, beloved. This completely contradicts what our Lord Jesus Christ said. God said our faith, our unity, our fellowship must be around the truth. It must be around the truth. I want my kids to have the truth, my grandkids to have the truth. I want your kids to have the truth. I want your grandkids to have the truth, amen? And only, the church is only one generation away from apostasy. It only takes one more pastor to come up here and start teaching smooth things, and the church is gone. You see, beloved, this neo-evangelicalism, Harold Ockengay said that neither denomination nor different doctrines should cause churches to separate from each other, but rather they must tolerate and congregate with each other. And beloved, this is totally unbiblical. It is diabolical heresy, and it is a radical departure from Scripture and the historic Orthodox Christian church, beloved. This is demonic philosophy. It's what spawned the heretical and compromised, compromising 
neo-evangelical church then and now. And it's what spawned the ecumenical church then and now. And it's what spawned the emergent church then and now. And it rose from such churches and leaders like C.S. Lewis. People honor C.S. Lewis. Hey, let me give you a back shot of him. He was an Episcopalian. He found the Lord, praised the Lord, but he ended up becoming a Roman Catholic. Denied many of the doctrines of the faith, but he was a great writer. Hey, it's easy to deceive. A great writer. But you look him up. You look at, find out any good Bible-believing church that will say he's right at the top of the list as one of the heretics of the faith. And yet many people follow him. Now, not only that, but like, what about Rick Warren? You see, these heretics like Dick Rick Warren and Bill Hybels and Bob Bell and Brian McLaren and James Dobson and Calvary Chapel. Can you imagine? Calvary Chapel, when I was coming up to the ranks, was considered an apostate church. Today it's orthodox. And it is compared to a lot of other churches. Then the Vineyard Church came out of that. The Vineyard Church was founded by the bass player of the, uh, of the um, Beach Boys. But he got too hurt for Chuck Smith and the Calvary Chapel, so he, Chuck Smith threw him out. And they started the Vineyard Churches. And the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal church, and yes, beloved, it also spawned the likes of Billy Graham. You say, Pastor, I'm going to kill you. Listen to me, please. I always tell you to do what with me? When Billy Graham was first preaching, I loved his preaching. He was a sin-hating, devil-stomping, pulpit-pounding, riddle-rattling, shingle-pulling, blood-bought, born-again Judean Christian, and he preached out the Word of God. But then he found out that he couldn't get a lot of people to his crusade. So what did he do? He started compromising what he believed. He started saying there's nothing wrong with the papacy. Millions have been killed under the papacy, beloved. That's why God raised them up to preach the truth. But then he started compromising. He said there's nothing wrong with holding crusades and having the, all the other churches, no matter what they believe, supporting us. And so he went off into heresy, uh, beloved. And I hate to say that, but that's the fact. And ultimately he compromised and denied some of the cardinal doctrines of the faith. He started denying about homosexuality, about being a real hell that burns forever. Well, beloved, you don't have to be a genius to know that. It's, the scripture says that, doesn't it? And I don't get any, believe me, I, I, I don't get any, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pleasure. Pleasure, saying that, beloved. And he started endorsing all these four, uh, false churches. And then, beloved, when you study them, they, they denied carnal doctrines of the faith like this, like the six-day creation. The Bible said God created this world in six days. The word days there is the Hebrew word yom. It means a 24-hour period, not an epoch. Now, God made plants on the fifth day. Well, if there was no sun until the sixth day, how did they grow? <laughs> you, know? you know, if there was epochs, millions of years in between there. And they started denying things like the global flood. They said it was a local flood, not a global flood. Well, why is there uh, fish fossils of Mount Everest and, and uh, Rocky Mountains and every place else if it was just local? And they started denying the virgin birth. And they started denying there's a literal hell and a, little, a literal heaven. And they teach that there's no real moral and spiritual absolutes. And they teach that uh, they, they've re redefined biblical terms. And they teach theistic evolution, that God started the spark and then he backed off and let it just evolve out of some primordial ooze. Is that what your Bible says? Hey, in the Gospels, Jesus said God created male and female, Adam and Eve. Christ referred to them. Was he lying to me? Was there an epic? Millions of years that transpired? Transpired? No, beloved. And then they started stressing intellectualism instead of faith. See, we're men of reason. And that's why today they're pushing science. Sci hey, beloved, I was trained in the sciences. You know how much science has changed since I was trained? Because <laughs> we're learning what really is and what we thought before was really science wasn't really science. Amen? Why? Because we're all human. And we make mistakes. And I thank God for the scientists. But they need to fast when they make a mistake. So, beloved, there's another thing. The pastor, well, what time am I getting out of here? By supper. You'll be home by seven. Beloved, there is danger in the part of the doctrine of eternal security. Also known as once saved, always saved. And this doctrine is Satan's baby, and it has sent more impenitent backsliders to hell than anyone. You see, folks, they teach that once you're saved, you can never lose your salvation, no matter how much you sin. And they say God may chasten and punish you, and with a premature death, he may kill you and take you home for getting drunk, but you'll never lose your salvation. Hey, you know what? 
I had a rough week this week. I just want to go home, get drunk, and if God strike me dead, get me out of here. How about you? <laughs> Today, if I ever sniffed the cap, it would put me down. <laughs> you see, but I was just the same old lie that Satan told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he's telling God's people today, you won't, sin, you won't die if you sin. No, no, you'll be like God. Don't worry about it. And people buy in that because they want security. And you are secure in Christ if you are secure in Christ. We believe in eternal security and you're secure in eternity. Amen. <laughs> what am I saying? I'm saying this. They teach that no matter how much you sin, after you get saved, no matter how much you disobey God after you save, no matter how much you apostatize after you get saved, you're still going to heaven. Hey, let me ask you a question. I want you to put your theological thinking caps on right now. Who do you think would want you to believe that doctrine, God or the devil? If I'm wrong, saying you've got to live holy, righteous, and godly, then you lost nothing. But what if they're wrong? I said to a preacher one time, he says to me, you know, you can't keep preaching, you're falling from grace. I says, why? The Bible teaches that. I says, what do you do when you go up? The Bible says no drunkard inherit the kingdom of God. Let's say Steve's a drunkard. Okay, let's say he's a drunkard. And I go up to Steve, he's over there in the gutter, and I say, Steve, wake up, wake up, wake up. <laughs> and I give him some coffee, and I wash his face. And I say, Steve, the Bible says, listen, my brother, there's no drunkard to inherit the kingdom of God. You need to snap out of this. You need to get back and get right with God. I said, what do you say? He'll come up to him and say, look, it, I guess you were never saved in the first place, Steve. And Steve says, well, what do I have to do to get saved? Well, you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to accept Jesus. But I did that, and I walked with God 20 years. But my wife ran off, and I went out, and I got drunk. Well, well God's going to strike you dead and take you to heaven. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, it would make a sane man blush to think like that. couple more I want to teach you. The Pentecostal movement. Believe. There's danger in the pot of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. They claim that they have all the supernatural gifts of the Spirit, just like the apostles have. They say they have the gifts of healing and tongues and prophecy and deliverers, and they literally raise people from the dead, and they've been slain in the Spirit, and they've gone up to heaven, and they've spoken with Jesus and the angels, and Jesus come down into their bedroom and spoke, and they shake hands with them, and he's become his best buddy. And the angels walk around with them. Beloved, when holy men of God stood in the presence of God, they fell as dead on their face, the Bible said. They didn't fall backwards. They fell where? Forwards on their face. But people say, oh, look at this guy. Benny Hinn's there going like this and waves of people falling over. You see, beloved, that's another spirit. That's the kundalini spirit, Satan's kundalini spirit that has come into the church. That's what kundalini yoga is, to release in the bottom of your spine the serpent that will come up, and he does. In other words, demon possession. I could tell you about a friend of mine, who was, I'll tell you quickly. He was a martial artist, and he had his doctorate in psychology, and he was brought up in a Nazarene church, and he walked with God. And one night, we, we, when we were doing the martial arts, he was a different style than me, but I used to go up once a week, myself and a bunch of us black belts, we'd go up there, and we'd uh, just practice disarming guns, knives, or whatever. Well, this particular night, I was packing my bags. My wife's right there, she'll tell you. And all of a sudden, I get a phone call. He said, JB, JB, get up here quickly, get up. I said, what's the matter, John? He said, get up here, get up here. Get my car, go up there. He comes running out, meets me at the car. He says, I almost got demon possessed. I said, John, hold the floor. What's going on here? Before he would work out, he studied a style known as Shotokan. And the founder of that style, his name was Gichin Funakoshi. And when you would go into the, these dojos, there would be a picture of Gichin Funakoshi there, and they would bow to it. When I was studying Kung Fu, my instructors used to say to me, you need to bow. I said, the only one I bow to was Christ. So everybody else is like this here, burning incense, and I'm over the back here going. <laughs> All right. We became great friends after that. But anyways... What happened was, he said, I, was, I had reached the pinnacle, and this guy could break bricks, break anything. He said, I had gone as far as I could physically, but I wanted a power that was outside of me, that was stronger than me. And so, so I stood there, and I went, this is. all of a sudden, this thing struck me in the back and said, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want this power? And immediately, what came to his mind is his youth, he was 
a Christian, as a Nazarene, he says, oh, uh, Jesus, deliver me, Jesus, deliver me. So I came up there with my Bible, and I went up to the third floor, and just to be, be in that room there, Pastor, when I walked into the room, brother, you, beloved, you could see your breath, and it was a fall day. It wasn't cold. And I walked in, and immediately I started going like this. I was dizzy as a coot, and I started reading the Word of God. And I started reading of Jesus dealt with Satan on the Mount, on uh, uh, the Mount of Temptation. And the whole room smelled like urine. I even had a 12-year-old girl one day who was demon-possessed. Took me and almost threw me out the window because she was demon-possessed. The point I'm getting at, beloved, that's the kundalini spirit that is in the church today. Jesus said there would be lying signs and wonders that would happen in the last days. Amen? I've got to add this to this. When I went there that day, he took all of the pictures off the wall of Funakoshi and he threw them in his wastebasket. He threw them in his fireplace. When he did that, the picture of Funakoshi that was all ripped up came up in the flame of the fire and said, I see you. And John and his wife, now remember, this guy is a psycho. He's one of the most intelligent guys I know. He went back like this here. His wife said she took a picture and threw it into the wastebasket, and the eyeball came out and says, I see you too. So Satan is real. And when you're messing around with that kind of power, beloved, and people saying, oh, it's the Lord that's doing it, it's not the Lord that's doing it. You'll know when it's the Lord doing it. Amen? And beloved, I've got a couple more that I could give you, and I'll just briefly tell you, okay? I just about had it. There's death in the part of contemporary Christian music in the church. Beloved, that's nothing but Christian words mixed with upbeat, hand-clapping, foot-stopping, nothing but that, beloved, in the church, and it's the devil's music. They repeatedly say the same refrain over and over again. Oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, Jesus loves you. Oh, Jesus loves you. And God says that we're not to do what? Not be like the pagans who babble the word of God. All they do is babble and babble. You say, beloved, you want to listen to that kind of, Listen at home. In the church, the music should have sanctity to it. Amen? It should have a sacredness to it. It should have a holiness to it. But today you think you're going to a rock concert, and they think it's the spirit move when you're all jumping around. And I have no problem clapping hands. But I do have a problem with the beat of what's going on. Amen? Also, beloved, and I'll close with this, the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. There's death in the pot for that. I'll end with this. Scripture nowhere teaches this unless you wrest text out of context. Now, beloved, I, I, I don't want to say this to tap myself on the shoulder, believe me. But when people come to me, especially a pastor, and I say to them, you show me from the Greek text where it says that. You see, beloved, you have to enter in with a preconceived notion to subjectively exegete, uh, eisegete, take out of that what you wanted already put in. The exegete means to objectively, that's where we get the Greek word exit, ex, go out of. To exegete means to lift out of the text what God has put in there. Then you can subjectively apply it to yourself. I'm sorry I kept it so long, but I had to get this off my heart. You see, beloved, but the pre-tribulation rapture teaches, hey, you know what? We don't have to worry about the last days and all this demon stuff and all the tribulation that's coming on, the attacks of the church, because we're going to be taken out before it ever happens. And they're not prepared for the final days, and they're not prepared for the final Antichrist. And they could damn What have you been saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying this. Because Satan has done everything he possibly could to creep into the church and get us all to think the same way. You know, you look at the TV today, and you look at the news, and you say, I can't believe any of that. But you know what, beloved? They know this, that if they can say enough things over and over and over and over again, that you're going to start believing it. And then they selectively cut excerpts of this, and that's how they're trying to impeach uh, Trump right now, it's called selective journalism. Just take a little piece of that, little piece of that, and you get what you want there. Same thing's happening in the church. You say it over and over and over and over again by enough people that are saying it, and they're saying, don't worry, we'll be out of here. There's nothing going to And God is right now moving, and I declare and decree that you're going to be healed. You know, Kenneth Copeland said he rebuked the COVID-19 virus last March, and it went away. Did it? <laughs> He's the prophet. 
There's death in the pot. Sorry I kept you so long. I only went 28 minutes, but... 